Today we welcome to our community a woman of strength, courage, determination, and a civil rights pioneer. Minnie Jean Brown Tricky was one of the nine African American students that fought for the right to quality education in 1957, also known as the Little Rock Nine. She is one of the first of many young activists to break the color barrier at Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, and around the country. Minnie Jean Brown Tricky was only 15 years old when she started to make history. Ms. Brown Tricky and eight other students faced daily harassment from angry mobs of students and parents in order to obtain equal rights to their education. She attended the school just as her peers with pride and determination, but conditions were so unsafe that they had to have personal guards right by their side. The controversy over this act of integration became so severe that the governor at the time closed all of Little Rock's high schools for a year in hopes of formulating a plan to prevent African Americans from integrating into white schools. The journey to equal rights in education was a never ending uphill battle and the fight to equal access became more complex. Minnie Jean Brown Tricky was the only one out of her peers to actively resist when she faced frequent harassment and was expelled for doing so. She showed great strength and power through her continued resistance when faced with physical harm. After Minnie, Minnie Jean Brown Tricky's suspension from Central High School, she was invited to move to New York City to live with Dr. Kenneth and Mammy Clark and attended New Lincoln School for her 11th and 12th grade years. Afterward, she went on to attend Southern Illinois University and majored in journalism. For a number of years, Minnie Jean Brown Tricky moved to Canada with her family where she got involved with First Nations activism and continued her education at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario, where she studied social work. Later in life, she returned back to the US where she served the Clinton administration as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Workforce Diversity at the Department of the Interior. Today, Minnie Jean Brown Tricky is a social activist. An example of her activism is her work with First Nations in Canada. She has also donated more than 20 personal items to the National Museum of American History to help share the story of the Little Rock Nine today. Moreover, one of her daughters, Spirit Tricky, works at Central High School National Historic Site, where she interprets the struggles her mother and the other eight African American students faced. When the Little Rock Nine never got the opportunity to enter their school peacefully, 40 years after the historic event, President Bill Clinton symbolically held the door open at the Central High for the nine students. In 2005, individual statues of the nine students were placed on the Arkansas Capitol. Clinton awarded each of the Little Rock Nine the Congressional Gold Medal in 1999. Minnie Jean Brown Tricky also was awarded the Springyard Medal by the NAACP and the Wolf Award. In 1996, seven of the nine students appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show and reconciled with their tormentors through their apologies and statements of why they acted the way they did, out of ignorance. We would like to welcome Ms. Brown Tricky into our community and say thank you for your historical bravery and coming here today to share your story with us. <laughs> thank you for the comprehensive introduction. Um, it really helps uh, for me and for the audience. I appreciate it. Um, so, me and Yoshi um, are going to ask you a few questions okay. um, that we thought would be helpful to tell about, like your story and your experience. Okay. Um, so we're going to start off with one question. So, what advice, if any, would you give your younger self about attending Central High and dealing with racism there? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> what would I tell my younger self? I think... Um, Growing up in a segregated society in Little Rock, Arkansas, I was really protected from overt individual racism, although I got on the back of the bus, couldn't go to hotels or water fountains, the whole thing that we're accustomed to seeing uh, as part of Jim Crow. So maybe I would have said to my younger self before, I stepped on Central's ground. That racism, racism exists, and it's a really, and it's then and now, uh, because I didn't understand it. I didn't understand uh, the extent of it, so I was really shocked 
by the hatred and the violence that was leveled against us. So I would have warned that girl, don't get your heart broken by all this hate. Uh, and so now, what I think we have to understand is if we're really socially conditioned, uh, despite what the real circumstances are in our society, we're socially conditioned that this is the best place and it's freedom and we're saying all the anthems and singing all the things. That messes up a person's head, okay? So I was not prepared because I had been conditioned one, to hate the Russians and to hide under the desk and that all the enemies were outside our country and all the problems were outside our country. So yeah, I got my heart broken pretty fast on that first day. So I would, have, I would advise my young self to learn more and kind of have a sense well, you know, if I'd known what I was going to face, I probably wouldn't have decided to go anyway. So it's better just to go in. <laughs> go in and find out later. Okay. Definitely, like, I can't imagine all the violence and, like, harassment and prejudice that you must have faced in Central. So how did you and the other nine sort of overcome that and focus on really trying to get your education? I would tell you. I don't think I learned anything at Central <laughs> in terms of uh, lessons. I remember that we had a, a, about a thousand page history book and of course I went to look for slavery and it had one paragraph on slavery and it said it was good for black people so of course I raised my hand in my history class and said, you know, I really worry about this. That Slavery was good for me, and, and it's only one paragraph in a thousand page book. Well, that's the kind of thing that'll get you in a lot of trouble uh, in, in a school that is trying to be, no, not really trying, but having to be. Um, so, what, it, what I can say is when I went to New Lincoln in New York, uh, there were a, a number of Jewish students. And, who, and I would go to their houses to spend a weekend or overnight. And their grandmothers liked to talk to me because they said I would eat. <laughs> and they were Holocaust survivors and they showed me their tattoos. Their own grandchildren said, she never, my grandmother never talked to me about that. Why did she talk to you? And I said, well, sometimes I'm not sure. <laughs> But so I didn't learn about the Holocaust in the black school, and I didn't learn about it in the white school. So let me tell you, I was miseducated in both places. And that's a, I like to think about what gets left out, what gets made smoother. I, I, like, I think American history is very much like a fairy tale. Truth is very hard to find in it. So that's my analysis. So I think that's really interesting in the fact that we're always looking for the truth. And so like on that topic, um, how did you come to the realization that the racism you faced from your classmates was actually taught to them and not really a natural part of their identity? Okay, I like that question because I think uh, I work with lots of young people in different spaces and often I get this um, statement, well, it's natural to be with your own kind. And I'm saying, well, what is your kind? Honey child. As, <laughs> you know, I mean, partly uh, to, to um, so what is a kind? And what is natural? So um, it is, so what I do when I was a, an anti-racism uh, trainer uh, our work was to help people unlearn because from Thomas Jefferson and his notes on Virginia, which mostly you don't study about Thomas, you study all the cool stuff he said and you don't. How many people have heard of the notes on Virginia? Okay, not enough, okay. So 
when I'm at the most expensive university in the country and I ask them, have they heard of Notes on Virginia? And they say no. I say, you need to get your money back. <laughs> so I mean, this is, this is kind of how we do it. Um, so it is about unlearning and it is about talking how people like Thomas Jefferson and all our founding fathers put that, inserted that into the discourse, into the thought, into the thinking of our nation. So it's, according to um, legal scholar Kluger, it's, it's a United States Amer uh, original sin. So if, if you believe in sin or not, but so it's really about unlearning all that. But it also, you have to point out where it came from. So I'm dealing with young people, white kids are saying, are you blaming me for slavery? Uh, no. But I'll blame you if you don't know that it existed and that it made a lot of money and it created wealth. And so it, that is, that interrogation is key to unlearning. And you know, the, I think the first rule of direct action in the principles of nonviolence is to educate yourself as much as possible. So we're, if we don't want it to be like this, we have to do something about it. Right. That's always my challenge. On that same topic of sort of like allies being able to be allied by expanding their own knowledge, at your time at Central, were there any specific white identifying allies that you remember trying to help you or attempting to help you? And furthermore, how do you think like nowadays um, white identifying students can be better allies to people of color identifying students? Okay, thank you. That wasn't the first question. Usually that's the first question. Were there any nice white kids? <laughs> <laughs> thank you that it wasn't first. <laughs> and, and, and really, uh, when I answer it, I say, you know, you really want me to say something because we you don't know, you don't want to be represented by the people sitting there with their mouths screaming hatred hatred and death and lynch them so 20 nice kids who faced the same kind of terror we did for being race traitors so that means we each had two people who would smile or i had a girl who would walk with me in the hall and Elizabeth, one girl who, who suffered post-traumatic stress from her time at Central said, a smile can save a life. So this is the kind of thing when you're talking to young people about bullying and, because it's the ultimate bullying story. So there are 20 nice kids, 200 terrorists, mean kids, and 1,900 silent witnesses, okay. And you know about Elliot Wiesel, you know, he says that sometimes it's not those who do the deed, it's those who stand by and say nothing. So basically, the 1,900 kids who did nothing or said nothing, I think they were completely um, on the side of the mean kids. So I'll, I'll just tell you a story. I was at a university in Peru, Nebraska, okay, you know. <laughs> not the Peru, Peru. <laughs> and, I, and I talked about the silent witness phenomenon, and there was a woman there who said, stood up with the question period, and she said, I was a student at Central, and I was a silent witness, and I want to apologize. So if, you, if you've ever seen slow, slow motion TV commercials where we were going toward each other, <laughs> both copiously weeping um, for that apology, because the apology thing has two components. <coughs> people need to apologize, and people need to be apologized too. So that was a beautiful moment where we could have a common experience. She'd been feeling bad all these years, 
And I really hadn't thought about her, but <laughs> I, I needed that too. So it's, it goes both ways. So talking about apologies and the things that were done to you, um, can you talk a little bit about your expulsion from Central High <coughs> and at that whole process and what you did? Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, I'm gonna tell you, I got expelled from Central because I was tall, beautiful, and proud. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that sounds, well, it sounds in your face, but it's true. Uh, part of their training was that we were inferior and that they were superior. And they thought, I mean, there was a young man on TV who says, white kid said, we made a mistake when we freed the slaves because we already know that they don't have the mental capacity to learn. And <laughs> so, you know, when you see something like that, this, the superiority, inferiority thing flips. Get me? Okay. So one, one of the things that I felt about the kids at Central was they couldn't think. I didn't hate them. I couldn't imagine wasting my time to hate them. But they hated me. And, and um, I just felt there was an absence of their willingness and let's just go right there and say ability to think. So that's my challenge always. You know, we have the capacity. Um, we know more than we've ever known. Uh, gee whiz, how come you have to just not think? Um, so when I was looking at the pictures, and I, you know, did you see how gorgeous I was with them? <laughs> The, the, some of the signs, I, I see them occasionally now. Uh, integration is a sin, okay, whatever. Uh, in integration is an abomination against God. Uh, integration is the Antichrist. So, I mean, there was this very interesting thing of hate and religion kind of mixed together, which is kind of what we see now. Um, and I swear, they just went into their basements and got the same signs and pulled them out for 2018, okay. So does that ring a bell about thought? About whether people think or whether people consider? So, you wanna know the truth of my expulsion, okay. <laughs> Well, that's two stories. First, it's the chili incident, which people tell the way they want to have it happen. But it was much more dramatic than anybody ever tells it. <laughs> so these guys were slamming their chairs uh, against me. And I could say they maybe knocked the tray out of my hand. Or, but when I went to the girl's vice principal and she said, did you do it on purpose? Ever resisting many Jean, I said, accidentally on purpose. <laughs> in fact, when you're in a situation like that, you almost, if you, you can't let them just make you into a non-person, just make you into an object. So you have to resist. I don't think that was particularly I thought it was true. Anyway, so, but the promise was when I was reinstated that I wouldn't, as if I'm involved in the incidents, as if I'm causing them, that I wouldn't be involved in any more incidents. And in the, blah, 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 fast forward, these five girls, they did it in gaggles. Uh, my heels were bleeding, they were spitting on me, they were calling me horrible words. And they just did that for about a week. And that was to, we, we sort of, without knowing it, the main thing is we didn't want to cry. 
no matter what they did, we didn't <coughs> want to let them see us cry. But you know, if somebody's doing that for a whole week, your resistance, you just get weaker every day. So as, and the rule was, if, did a teacher see it? And a teacher didn't see anything, so this is all quick, but you're getting the picture. So as I'm turning to go in my homeroom, somebody threw a purse, hit me on the back of my head, and it wasn't good. So I picked up the purse, looked in it, it had six combination locks in it. So stupid me, what do you think I did? What would you, what, what would you like for me to have? Swing it around. Wah! Back. Okay. I wasn't that smart, okay? I threw it on the floor and turned and said, leave me alone, white trash. Well, guess what? A teacher saw that, and that's why I got expelled. But I didn't have my evidence. I didn't have my proof. So when I was looking at my expulsion notice on Thursday, the one that the teacher from the school got from the the picture from the Library of Congress. It said that I called a girl white trash and then she threw a purse at me. Now, does that make sense? Do you carry around your purse with six combination locks? <laughs> As I said earlier when I was talking to my tour guides, I don't trust American history very much because it can be manipulated. And in that case, that was manipulated against me. And that's in perpetuity because it is in the Library of Congress, okay? And then I have another one which is in the uh, Smithsonian of American history. So, that was a long answer, but these things are complicated, okay? Connecting back to what you're saying about um, how you you still manage to like stand, stand proud and sort of maintain your own strong identity even with all this prejudice towards you. What advice do you have for any people going through similar things, similar minorities or people of color, in which they can sort of you know, stand back against prejudice and racism without creating like a necessarily hostile environment? Resistance is already you're considered hostile, right? So that's the first thing we have to understand. Um, in Little Rock, they have a video of sort of introductory in the Little Rock Visitor Center. And there's a momentary uh, view it's a with Black Lives Matter and people get up and walk out of the movie and say, that's a terrorist organization. Uh, the other thing that causes people to walk out is a group of kids in New Mexico are working on an environmental uh, situation. They're opposing something. So people get mad about that because they use the word climate change. So you're dealing with a national phenomenon of hashtag profound intentional ignorance. <laughs> and when you're dealing with that, it's really hard because, you know, okay. So, I mean, I just say what comes to me, anyway. Um, you know, people say, take their country back. I'm saying, are you kidding me? I mean, black people have been here since 1616, and who the hell are you gonna take it back from? You already stole it from the indigenous people. So what are you talking about? Who are you? So there's, there's a, you know. So there's a, a level of resentment that I feel to those kinds of statements and those signs that mix religion with hate, you know, Christ, anti-abomination, all that, uh, which is really, so 60 years ago, Little Rock happened, and I'm seeing the same signs, and I'm saying, nothing has changed? Oh my God, is nothing has changed? Uh, so I, that disturbs me. Uh, but I am a proponent of nonviolence, uh, the first principle of nonviolence is nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. And let me tell you, that's the most courage you have to have is to be a nonviolent person 
in a society that values violence to such an extent. So you could always be in opposition. And so really, nonviolence is the only to, yeah, if you're going to protest, you got to learn something. You cannot just go out into the streets. You've got to be trained. You've got to learn how to keep you from bashing your head in, and sometimes they will anyway. And so if I look at the pictures of us standing between the Arkansas National Guard and the mob of hate, hated people, we look so calm. We are shaking in our boots. We are so scared. But I think it's feel the fear and do it anyway. That it doesn't mean you're not going to be scared. And it also doesn't mean you're not going to get hurt. But I think what I've seen, I've trained done a lot of training for groups, um, indigenous peoples and other groups who are trying to um, make social change. And training is really important. Uh, Nonviolence is an intellectual, spiritual, it's one of the most amazing um, sort of philosophies. I mean, it takes from all religions. It's not itself something independent. It takes from all religions. But we have all kinds of rules and ways and models for violence in every kind of thing, in our music, in our movies, in our television, in our games. But we, we have these six principles that, that we, we can look at ways of being nonviolent. So that's my thing, and I am crazy for it. And it's very hard. So yeah, you can be scared, but be prepared. Okay? That's my On the topic of like being prepared and kind of like looking at racism that's like in institutions, especially today, um, where it's kind of harder to point it out. Um, so I know you talked a little bit about the process of your expulsion, but how do you think that reflects a similar system um, of the school to prison pipeline today? Um, for people who don't know that, basically the school to prison pipeline is the, dispro the disproportionate tendency of minors and young adults from disadvantaged backgrounds to become incarcerated because of increasingly harsh school and municipal um, policies. Um, many experts have credited factors such as school disturbance laws, zero tolerance policies and practices, and an increase in police and schools in creating this pipeline that goes on today. You explained it really well. And it, um, at first they said that um, when you have police in schools, it was hurting boys. The, they were being punished disproportionately. And now it includes girls. There's been a report made by the uh, Women's Legal Fund and the, the uh, NAACP that says girl, black girls, well, girls of color are being also sent into the juvenile system. So we're looking at the same thing that happened to me because when I would go into the uh, disciplinary office where somebody kicked me down a flight of stairs, the girls vice principal would say, what did you do now? So that's a pretty graphic illustration of what was happening then and what happens now. Now, I've been going to Youngstown, Ohio for 10 years, I think. These um, Youngstown has designated the most challenged city in the United States. So there are no jobs, blah, blah, blah. just horrible uh, because of health care, all kinds of things. But these kids in this city have a nonviolence week. They got the declared by the mayor. They have a nonviolence parade. They went to their governor and he declared nonviolence in the state of Ohio. So these kids 
weren't supposed to be the ones who would achieve something. But they have police in their schools. And if they get in trouble, instead of going to the principal's office, they get the, handled by the police. So a lot of these kids are economically disadvantaged. Many of them are of color, and they're mostly black, because um, nobody really wants to go to Youngstown as an immigrant, um, truth be known. But in the Youngstown city schools, they have the police. But 20 minutes out of Youngstown, you go to the school that are predominantly white, and that police person has a little office in the back. They don't have metal detectors. So you treat kids like they're already in jail. And so it's almost like training them to be ready to go into prison. Uh, well, Angela Davis, who is a Californian, speaks out about that quite a lot. And there are initiatives to challenge that. But when you think about um, a couple of things, you're in an independent school, so a lot of this doesn't affect you. But it's this, this corporatization of public schools is similar to the corporatization of <coughs> prisons. So somebody's making money off this, and that's the, the challenge to how do you stop people from wanting to do the wrong thing for gain. So those, I don't know the answer. Um, as an activist on all kinds of levels, I can get really fragmented. But what my advice is to active, activists is to try to find that issue that you're really, really interested in. Because you can get fragmented really easy. I'm a convicted tree hugger. I've been in jail for sitting in and all kinds of things. So I, mean, I see the relationship with all the issues as the same. But I think in order to maintain your vigor and your enthusiasm to use, work on the issue that you like best. Now, um, we'd like to open up questions to the whole room. I think people brought questions in. So, um, yeah, we can just pass the mic around. Does anyone have any questions? Hi, my name is Annabelle, um, and my question is, how do you think different minority groups, such as like the black community and the queer community, or maybe disabled people and um, people of marginalized religions, how do you think um, all of these people can best come together and fight for equality? Okay, so you, you, you've already answered it. It's about coalition building. Uh, first of all, stop thinking. I mean, when we think of ourselves as minorities, somehow minor, we fit into the paradigm of somebody is more important. So that coalition building takes us out of the so-called minority status and puts us into a status of people who have coalesced. I say collude, coalesce, co do all the words are coming together. Uh, what what uh, power, whatever it is, tends to want to power whatever it's, whoever, whatever, however it exists, would tell us that we are, we have disparate needs and our issues aren't the same, but really the formula is the same, all oppression has a particular formula. So power would have us divided and in conflict all the time. So that, I guess, if the first principle of nonviolent action is to get education about a particular issue, the more we're educated, the, the more we know that our issues are the same and that we, de we do need to have more um, working together. So. That's, but that's part of the thing about, if I try to do everything, then I'm fragmented. But when we do things together, we, we become less fragmented and more cohesive. So that's how we do that, in my opinion. What was like your personal experience going uh, to a high school with 
like obviously all white teachers, many of whom were presumably very racist. And like, how do you think that that kind of lack of uh, minority representation in the in the faculty and in the uh, administration kind of connects to what you're talking about earlier with the school to prison pipeline and like a lack of leadership? Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, first of all, one of the things that happened when they sort of moved toward desegregation is all the black um, administrators got fired. And what, what happened in, for instance, a lot in the South is black teachers were often better educated than white teachers because uh, when they wanted to go to university, they would send them away so that they wouldn't challenge, say, the University of Arkansas or whatever. So all our principals were PhDs, and most of our teachers were masters. But in the white school, they could do that one-year teacher's college or something, high school and one year. So when they did the research, they found out the black teachers were better educated than the white teachers, but they all got fired um, when sort of desegregation happened. Um, you know, I talk to young people all the time and they say, well, I don't see anybody who looks like me. Uh, and I say, I don't need somebody who looks like me for me to get an education. Uh, that in education we, we get, no matter where we are, which school, and, um, but what happens is, what has happened in the United States, especially in the public school system, is very young white teachers, because they don't want to pay the salaries of the ones who've been there a long time. So, one, we don't have any cult, cross cultural training to work with people. Uh, we are, you know, we have a society that says speak English, and we, I, my friend, um, one of the Rock Nine, Gloria Ray, lives in Sweden, and her kids speak six languages, and we're screaming, speak English, you know, and I'm saying, oh my God, more profound hashtag intentional, <laughs> you know. So, so um, it, it is about um, valuing teachers, which we tend not to do in our society and other societies place great value in teachers. So we, uh, there, are, there are things that we really need to do. How can we not value the people who work with our most important asset as a society who are teachers? So we have teachers this, teachers that, teachers that, constant. So, so much of it is uh, shifting the language and being careful about what we say and how we speak about others. So, I mean, we really need a, a whole kind of reshaping of our what we think and what we believe. Um, so, I'm going to go about trashing people who shouldn't be trashed and talk about how um, the young people in Florida were maligned and said to be something they weren't. So I mean, we, we, we do that. We do that. We do that to our children. We do it to our teachers. We do it to activists who are calling for some kind of social change. So we have the apparatus to malign people so we have to rethink about the apparatus to honor, to support, to, but again, it's about thinking. It's a really simple thing. Just wondering about some of the work you've done in your adult life um, with First Nations people in Canada. Um, what exactly um, have you been doing and uh, what differences do you see in the uh, treatment and perception between indigenous people in Canada and the United States? It's hard to tell because I don't live in the States, so I don't really know. Uh, Ms. McAvoy had a really good uh, magazine that I was reading uh, last night and so people 
you know, that activism takes a lot of, you know, people are looking for sovereignty. How did I get involved in uh, indigenous issues? I went to, uh, back to university in sort of my middle life, and I was at this um, university which had um, French, um, English, and indigenous streams in social work. And I expressed a desire to take, they also had a major in na Native Studies. And so I uh, sort of accidentally fell into the indigenous stream of social work. And it was the first year of that. And so all, I got all kinds of jobs based on that expertise. I was involved in blockades um, on, on they call them reserves in Canada, uh, saving old growth forests. Um, I trained uh, blockade members in uh, violence. Uh, so you just kind of do what you need to do. You do what you're asked to do. Um, and their issues are similar, but they're not the same as immigrants or people of color, they have a different relationship with the state. So, but they have things like poverty and addiction. They have the same issues that everybody else has. Um, so it's good work. So while I'm working with immigrant and refugee women in Canada, I'm also working with First Nations. And I see the same. And I'm working with Inuit, and they've been saying, oh my god, for 25 years, it's melting. And did anybody care? Nobody paid attention till Al Gore said it. I mean, the circumpolar people have been sounding the alarm. My friends, the people I worked with, say, it's melting, it's melting. Huh, do we care? What do they know? Um, so, it's been a, an honor and a pleasure, the people that I've been involved with and worked with. And it's enriched my life immeasurably. If I die tomorrow, I'm fine, because I've done a lot of the things that I've wanted to do, and I've had the pleasure of working across cultures, across sectors, within and without. So. Specifically, I can't answer your question because I don't know the difference between uh, Indigenous people in Canada. But I'm going to New Zealand in May, and I'll be doing work with the Maori there. And um, I, <laughs> I'm lucky. I'm telling you, I, I'm just so lucky. Um, I worked with uh, in townships. In South Africa, that's the indigenous peoples, although we don't call them that. Uh, so, yeah, whatever. Give it to me. <laughs> Hi there, right here. Um, um, I was just wondering, given all the racial discrimination that you faced throughout your life, how do you find the strength and courage to come back and work, do anti-racism work, especially with white people? Like, don't you want to just like get the heck out of there? <laughs> But if I get the heck out of there, nothing changes. Uh, so right, the, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a life sentence, what I do, okay. Um, and it both, the, it, it, you know, both causes me despair, but it also energizes me. So that's how we do it. We take the bitter with the sweet. I mean, Central High School was a nightmare, but it, I became a particular kind of person, a very compassionate, caring person because of that. Uh, and so that's kind of how I operate. I, I'm, I'm, yeah, and, I, and I've seen things happen, and I've seen magic happen. And I've seen, what is the opposite of magic, the bad stuff? I see that happening, and I'm sorry for us, really. And so, so much is being uh, rolled back, and it's discouraging. But hey, young people can make presidents act, so go for it, okay? I was wondering, do you think segregation has evolved into like a modern problem? And if so, how? 
I don't, I mean, all, all I can say is, what do you think? Uh, <laughs> um, I, I was asked by a student, it's funny, I'm sorry, he said, all the Asian kids sit together in the cafeteria. What do I think of that? And I said, don't ask me what I think about it. Ask each other what you think about it. And maybe as we sit in groups, maybe we should interrogate that and say, why are we all sitting together? Isn't it boring? Oh my God, you know? Um, my, uh, we have a big celebration at uh, Canada Day. It's just a drinking party and all that. <laughs> and, and, I, and I have six kids, so it's uh, never fewer than 12 people in the house at any given time. And uh, my niece from uh, the U.S. went, she said, Aunt Mimi, your house looks just like the U.N. I said, and that's how I want it. I did not, I was, grew, grew up in a very boring society that had only black people and only white people. And I'm sorry, that's too boring for words. So I'm gonna make sure my kids don't grow up like that. And yes, I want my living room to look like the UN because that expands my consciousness. So if you sit together, nobody asks, why all the white kids sitting together in the cafeteria? Did you notice that? So we're always interrogating sort of trivial phrases that get thrown at us and talked about us. So that is what we interrogate is, how dare you? And then we interrogate our group. Why are we all sitting together? Some people do it for protection. Some people, because they have something in common, there are all kinds of different reasons. But that's what your next di discussion should be when you're all sitting together in your culture groups in the cafeteria. Why are we doing this? Thank you so much. I think I speak on behalf of the whole school when I say that we're really, truly honored to have you here with us today. So I think your story is super valuable, both in its raw and horrific truth and for the inspiration that you pass on to us, especially us young people, that we can make positive change in the world by standing up against injustice. Your message comes at a really critical time in history when tension among disparate groups is high, whether they be grounded in politics, race, religion, gender or sexual orientation or another core identifier. Thank you, Minnie Jean, for your time, your courage, and your unrelenting drive to make this world what you believe it can be. I would also like to acknowledge the Patterson Initiative that made Ms. Brown Tricky's visit today possible. The Patterson Ethics Initiative Speaker Series invites speakers who address ethical issues pertinent to our community on a school-wide, global, and or local scale. In their words, the Patterson Ethics Initiative seeks to foster ethical and empathetic development of students, furthering Lick's mission to develop the capacity, confidence, compassion, and commitment to change the world. Thank you all for being here, and a special thank you to Minnie Jean Brown Tricky.